BYU devotional address with Lloyd Newell was given on December 9th, 2014. Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to our devotional. My name is Brent Webb, and I've been asked to conduct today's meeting. We are pleased to have Lloyd D. Newell, Professor of Religious Education, as our speaker this morning. We extend a special welcome to his wife, Carmel, who is seated on the stand beside Brother Newell, and their family and friends who are seated in the audience. Professor Newell holds a master's degree in communications and a PhD in marriage, family, and human development from Brigham Young University. Brother Newell has been the voice and writer for the Mormon Tabernacle Choir's weekly inspirational broadcast of music and the spoken word since 1990. This historic broadcast, the longest continuous broadcast in the world, is heard and seen each week on more than 2,000 television, radio, and cable stations by millions of people worldwide. Brother Newell has addressed audiences in 46 states and more than a dozen countries through his seminars and keynote speaking engagements. He has worked as a television news anchor and news magazine host in Pennsylvania and Utah, as well as for CNN in Atlanta, Georgia. He is the author of more than a dozen books, including his most recent entitled The Gospel of Second Chances. Brother Newell and his wife Carmel are the parents of four children. Now we'll have the opportunity of hearing from Brother Lloyd Newell. I am grateful to be with you on this cold December morning, and I pray that the warmth of the Spirit will bless us that we might be edified during our few moments together. Today, I want to talk with you about the greatest story ever told and one of its less obvious but most important themes. You could probably recite much of it by heart. It occupies a little more than a page of Scripture. It begins with the familiar duty of paying taxes. It continues with a journey that was most unusual, uh, not unusual, rather, for the time. The plot thickens when no room can be found in the inns. It culminates when the Son of God is born of Mary, a precious and chosen virgin. We know little about the real people and few details regarding the true events. And yet, no matter how many times we read the story of the first Christmas, there always seems to be something new we can learn from it. That's because, as prophets have taught, the Word of God is quick or living. It takes on fresh and deeper meaning whenever we are spiritually ready to receive it. Something that stands out to me in the account of the Savior's birth is that on four separate occasions, an angel appears with the message, Fear not. When the angel Gabriel appeared to Zacharias with news that his wife would bear a son, the forerunner of the Messiah, he said, Fear not, for thy prayer is heard. Later, the same angel visited beautiful and fair Mary to tell her that she would be the mother of the Son of God, assuring her with similar words, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Shortly thereafter, an angel appeared to Joseph the carpenter in a dream and said, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. And then on that holy night, as all eternity watched in reverent silence, the angel came upon humble shepherds keeping watch over their flock. The shepherds, who were sore afraid, heard the angel proclaim, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people." So much of what happened during those pivotal moments in the Nativity narrative depended upon the courage of people like Zacharias, Mary, Joseph, and the shepherds. God had a monumental task for each of them. Their lives were about to change forever. Imagine if they had let fear overcome them. What if they had pulled back, doubted, and failed to do what God needed them to do? This less obvious theme from the account of the first Christmas intrigues me because I, like you, 
have fears. And I need to be reminded at times to fear not. I don't know what your fears are. You may have fears about your family, like Zacharias, who feared that he would never have children. Or maybe your fear isn't that you won't have children, but that you will have children whom you have to raise in a toxic world, increasingly hostile to families. Like Mary, you may have an assignment or responsibility that seems far beyond your abilities. Like Joseph, you may fear getting married or that you will never get married. Like the shepherds, you may be sore afraid when your peaceful, simple life is disrupted because God has plans for you that are bigger than what you had for yourself. Life presents endless opportunities to fear. We may fear what people think of us. We may fear failure or rejection. We may be afraid of changes we know we must make in our lives. Or maybe we're just afraid of next week's final exams. We may experience failure or rejection and wonder if we have what it takes. We may have financial fears, educational and career fears, or fears of public speaking, snakes or spiders. Yes, we live in a beautiful world, but it can be scary out there. Now, I fear that so many of you have come this morning to be edified and inspired, and now I've gone and frightened you. Well, I didn't come here to frighten you, and you didn't come here to be reminded of your fears. We all long for more of God's peace and strength in the midst of the stresses and difficulties of life. The Lord's message to you today is the same message He sent through His angels so long ago. Fear not. He can say that because He knows more than we do. He sees what we cannot see. He knows what's coming, and in the eternal scheme of things, it's not as bad as we may think. He knows that we can handle it with His help because He knows how to strengthen and succor us. Most of all, He tells us not to fear because He knows that fear will paralyze us. It will keep us from knowing and doing His will, accepting His blessings, His love, and His light, and fulfilling His purposes. As President Howard W. Hunter said, fear is a principal weapon in the arsenal that Satan uses to make mankind unhappy. He who fears loses strength for the combat of life in the fight against evil. Therefore, the power of the evil one always tries to generate fear in human hearts. A timid, fearing people cannot do their work well, and they cannot do God's work at all. Latter-day Saints have a divinely assigned mission to fulfill that simply must not be dissipated in fear and anxiety." End quote. Satan wants us to give in to fear. God wants us to hold on to hope. One of my favorite scriptures is found in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. It reads, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Using these words as a framework, let us explore together how, how these things can serve as antidotes for fear. First, God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power. This spirit of power is not the world's sort of power. The Lord and His covenant people do not work the way the world usually works. The world tells us that power comes of wealth or popularity, that life is a competition in which we advance ahead of others by acquiring more, by brandishing words or weapons of destruction. The Lord's way is deeper, higher, holier. His power is governed by long-suffering, by gentleness and meekness, and by love unfeigned, by kindness and pure knowledge. Where worldly power depends on dramatic demonstrations, the Lord's power distills upon us as the dews from heaven, miraculously, but quietly and humbly. Where 
worldly power is for the privileged few, the Lord's power is available to all. It is manifest in the ordinances of the priesthood. We access it through making and keeping sacred covenants. We nurture it through sincere prayer, fasting, and feasting upon the words of Christ. Perhaps you know someone who has this kind of power and therefore seems fearless. It's probably someone that uh, would be judged by worldly standards as weak, but his or her spiritual power is undeniable. My father, who died in an accident nearly 30 years ago, was such a man. Still today, I meet people who say to me, he was the kindest man I've ever known. He worked in a steel mill, not the most glamorous or prestigious of occupations, and I'm embarrassed to say that when I was young, I wished he were smarter, cooler, richer. Thankfully, I've grown up since then, and today there is no one I admire more. I doubt any of you have ever spent a day at a steel mill, but let's just say that it's not the quietest or cleanest environment. Power in that setting is usually asserted through gruffness and crude language. And yet my father, in his more than three decades there, was never known to swear or to speak an unkind word. He never even raised his voice. After he died, his co-workers told us what, that they could always count on him to be pleasant and positive, regardless of the circumstances. We found curled up in his lunchbox several church pamphlets that he faithfully studied during his lunch break and often shared with his co-workers, many of whom became active in the church because of his goodness and example. That is fearless power. It's the kind of power that comes to those who trust God and have faith in Jesus Christ, faith to do things His way, even if they differ from the world's way. That faith is more than mere positive thinking or motivational rah-rah, as the prophet Joseph Smith taught. Faith is power. It inspires and empowers us to do remarkable and courageous things that we would not be able to do otherwise. Truly, this kind of faith gives us the power and confidence that will wax strong in the presence of God and all people. If you are fearful because you feel powerless, I invite you to turn to the Lord. Draw upon the power of the covenants you have made and are keeping. Trust in God's power, for it is mightier than any power on earth. His words to ancient Israel are also His words to you. I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not. I will help thee. Next in Paul's list of fear-banishing virtues is love. As both Paul and Mormon taught, perfect love casteth out all fear. Anyone who has served a mission knows what I'm talking about. A full-time mission, if you think about it, would be a petrifying experience if it weren't for love, love for God and for all His children. But tens of thousands of young men and women, include many of you, do it every year because God has granted them the gift of Christ-like love. We all know young missionaries who couldn't even spell Guatemala, let alone find it on a map when they got their mission call. But by the time they returned, they had the Guatemalan flag hanging on their bedroom wall and memories of beloved Guatemalan people in their hearts. Some missionaries receive this gift of love before they even leave. Others don't find it until well into their service. But every missionary, at some point or another, has to learn to love the people, or else their mission will be miserable. This was the greatest lesson I learned as a missionary in Argentina many years ago. Throughout my mission, I did my best, and we were blessed with success. But my first year was different from my second year. The first year, my motives were not completely pure. I wanted to lead the mission in baptisms, to move up the mission ladder, to impress others. Thankfully, I was matched with a more consecrated companion. 
who showed me how to love and enjoy the people more, how to serve them with heart and soul, how to forget myself and go to work with love. My focus and motives changed. I truly got a new heart, and I came home different than when I left. Perhaps the most stunning example of the power of love to overcome fear comes from the sons of Mosiah and their remarkable mission to the Lamanites. I don't think we fully appreciate how courageous they were. The Lamanites weren't merely apathetic toward the gospel. They were openly hostile. They were sworn enemies who routinely killed Nephites just for being Nephites, not exactly golden contacts. So why did the sons of Mosiah do it? They were desirous that salvation should be declared to every creature, for they could not bear that any human soul should perish, yea, even the very thoughts that any soul should endure endless torment did cause them to quake and tremble. Their intense love was so powerful that they simply had to share the gospel with everyone. They couldn't bear not to. When we love with that kind of strength and sincerity, we overcome fear. Of course, love conquers fear, not just in missionary work, but in all aspects of life. When young Gordon Hinckley and Marjorie Pay were engaged to be married, Gordon began to worry about the economic realities of marriage during the Depression-ridden 1930s. He called his fiance and said that they needed to talk. They agreed to meet over lunch. I think you should know, he told her, that I only have $150 to my name. He added that he only made $185 a month. Marjorie put his fears to rest with her unexpected, optimistic response. Oh, that will work out just fine. If you've got $150, we're set. <laughs> Reflecting on her thoughts that day, Marjorie said, I had hoped for a husband, and now I was getting $150, too. <laughs> Sister Hinckley's love and faith empowered her to fear not as they started their lives together, a marriage that would become nearly seven decades of love and faith and service. Love gives meaning to life, even amid life's uncertainties. It's what keeps us going when we feel like giving up. It can be what gets us up in the morning and what settles us into sweet dreams at night. Love is the essence of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It has no end and no limits. It remains when all else fails. Love never quits and never runs out. It simply endures and overcomes. Indeed, it never faileth. We cannot look to the world for that kind of love. All you have to do is examine the ways popular culture uses the term love, and it's obvious that Satan just doesn't get it. Always, love's counterfeits slip quickly into thinly veiled selfishness, lust, pride, and even hatred. God, on the other hand, not only understands love, He is love. In fact, our expressions of love are but echoes and approximations of the continuous and unlimited love of God. Our efforts to nurture love would fail were it not for infusions of divine love along the way. Ultimately, all love comes from God. The more we seek Him, the more we will feel His love working a mighty change in our hearts and in the hearts of those we love. What could we fear when filled with such love? Several years ago, on a cold winter night, some of our extended family volunteered to serve dinner in a homeless shelter during the Christmas season. At first, some of the younger children were a bit frightened by the sights and smells and sounds of the inner city shelter. They had never been so close to such distress before. But in time, a, a little Christmas miracle took place. As we served the hot meal, we all began to interact with the homeless residents. We exchanged smiles, laughter, and small talk. Then the singing started. No one really remembers who began to sing first. Perhaps one of the residents or one of the children, 
But before long, everyone was singing Christmas carols. The room filled with the sweet spirit of Christmas. It became like a great party, almost a family reunion. They were no longer strangers, but brothers and sisters, children of the same God. It was powerful, personal, and poignant, a night never to be forgotten. It reminded me of a passage from Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, when Scrooge's nephew Fred rather boldly defends Christmas against his uncle's bah humbugs. He describes Christmas as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time, the only time I know of in the long calendar of the year when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut-up hearts freely and to think of people around them as if they really were fellow passengers and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys. No heavenly angels sang that night at the shelter, at least not in the literal sense, but heaven seemed close. We felt love, love for God, each other, and all humanity. As the evening ended and we stepped back into the cold night, we each felt the joy and meaning of Christmas more deeply. The stars shone a little brighter, and we all felt a little closer to a few of our fellow passengers on life's common journey. If you are fearful, whatever your fears may be, I invite you to turn to the Lord and trust in His love, His goodness, His grace. It is mightier than any force on earth. His loving words to the early saints are also His words to you. Fear not, little children, for you are mine, and I have overcome the world. Finally, in addition to power and love, God has given us the spirit of a sound mind to dispel fear. What does it mean to have a sound mind? The word sound means safe, secure, reliable. And how do we achieve a sound mind? By anchoring ourselves to the safest, most secure, most reliable rock in the ocean, the Lord Jesus Christ and His restored gospel. You and I and the rest of the world are in the midst of an intellectual storm, a hurricane of philosophies and ideologies, with winds of doctrine tossing many of us to and fro, groups and individuals who are antagonistic toward religion in general, Christianity in particular, and Latter-day Saints specifically, are gaining in influence and spreading their deceptive messages. Their goal is simple to destroy faith. And sadly, we all have friends or loved ones who have become their victims. In such circumstances, it is not easy to keep a sound mind or avoid becoming fearful. Only those who have anchored their lives firmly to the Savior will survive. Or to use imagery that perhaps is more familiar in landlocked Provo than hurricanes and anchors, Consider the beautiful mountains that stand just outside this building. The phrase, the shadows of the everlasting hills, comes to mind. They seem pretty stable and permanent, don't they? They don't look like they're going away anytime soon. But as reliable as those mountains look, I would never stake my spiritual safety on them. I think that may be in part what Isaiah was trying to say when he prophesied, every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low. Isaiah continues, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of God shall stand forever. Do you remember how green the grass used to be on campus just a few months ago? Do you remember the colorful flowers that once adorned the courtyards? Seems like a distant memory on a day like today, doesn't it? Well, compared to the Word of God, all of the dogmas, kingdoms, and institutions of man are about as permanent as the withering grass and the fading flower. If I had placed my trust in something so fleeting, I would definitely be fearful. That's certainly not the product of a sound mind, 
No, in this storm, I'd much rather take my refuge in the word of God. That is what Jacob, the brother of Nephi, did. He feasted on the scriptures, delighting in them, cherishing them. So when the charismatic and persuasive Sherem came along, seeking to overthrow the doctrine of Christ, leading away many hearts, and eventually targeting Jacob specifically, Jacob could not be shaken. He had simply had too many spiritual experiences with eternal truth to ever be deceived by any counterfeit. If you and I can follow Jacob's example and build our lives on the firm foundation of the word of Christ, we will receive an additional blessing beyond immunity to deception. In moments when we need correction or when serious questions and doubts arise or when further revelation is necessary to spur us to greater action, we will not become offended, upset, impatient, or deceived. In fact, we will rejoice to meekly receive more of the divine word we love so much. When Jacob had to speak reproving words to his people, he noted that the words of truth are hard against all uncleanness, but the righteous fear them not, for they love the truth and are not shaken. To those who are pure in heart, he observed, the word of God is pleasing, and they feast on his word because their minds are firm forever. Can you see how men and women with a sound mind, anchored firmly to the gospel of Jesus Christ, have no need to fear when testimony and true conversion burn in their hearts and in their heads? They are unfazed by the latest fads and philosophies of men because they recognize them for what they are, and they are unafraid to receive truth even if it requires them to change. Nephi said of such humble yet rock-solid souls, he that is built upon the rock receiveth truth with gladness, while he that is built upon a sandy foundation trembleth, lest he shall fall. Let us take courage in these vigorous words from a favorite hymn. They are written as if from the Lord's own mouth. Fear not, I am with thee, O be not dismayed, for I am thy God and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand, upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. Truly, a firm foundation can uphold us as we face all kinds of difficulties in life, sickness, health, poverty, wealth, deep waters, fiery darts, and fiery trials. For the soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I cannot, desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no never, no never forsake. The Lord stands ready to help. I invite you to turn to the Lord and build upon his firm foundation. It is mightier and more permanent than any foundation on earth. The world needs your spiritual power, your love and light, your sound mind and heart. The Lord's words to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery are also his words to you. Fear not, little flock, do good. Let earth and hell combine against you, for if ye are built upon my rock, they cannot prevail. Look unto me in every thought. Doubt not, fear not. I don't know whether I was part of the heavenly choir that sang glory to God on the night of that first Noel, but I certainly can add my humble witness to that of the angels. I testify that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and because Unto us was born that day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. We have no need to fear, for he has indeed brought with him peace on earth and goodwill toward men. I testify that these good tidings are for all people, 
including me and including you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. This BYU devotional address with Lloyd Newell was given on December 9th, 2014. 